This is It Takes Two. Amy Eiler, J.J. Gordon here on the Mighty 790 KFGO. And Mr. Andrew Oak joins us again, the first ladies man. It is a fan favorite here on IT2 when we get him on the air. Andy Oak, welcome back to KFGO Radio. Nice to be here with you guys, and happy holidays to everyone. Yes, happy holidays to you. Andy, let's start with this. Your books are easily the best stocking stuffers for the history buffs, the, (laughs) the, the, the patriots out there, the people who love to hear the stories that they've never heard before about the history of this country. And you just happen to focus on the first ladies, the people who've made the White House what it is today. I've got both editions of your book, and Mm -hmm, I send them out to friends Mm -hmm. on a kind of frequent basis because they are funny, they are original, and there's still time to get them before the holidays, yes? Yes, I'm signing and shipping daily, and thank you, JJ. It, it it really, you know, we and the fan favorite. I mean, it's just it's just I'm so flattered and humbled by by you guys out there, and and it's just great all the support, all the interest, and everything. And as many times as I've been on, we're really just scratching the surface here, and that's why I wrote the books. I like to talk more than I like to write. It's more fun. I like getting out and engaging with people, but you can't fit all these stories into an interview. You can't fit them into a a live speech or event. So the beginning to the end, Martha Washington through uh, the the Trump election in 2016 is where I I left off in volume two. Volume one is the 1700s and 1800s. Volume two, 1900s, all the way up through 2016. And then once the Obama Museum opens up and the Trump Museum and the Biden Museum and things like that. I'll be able to update and add chapters and things like that. But the story is pretty complete, uh, all things considered. And, and, and it is a, it's just was such a fun adventure working for and with the White House Historical Association and C-SPAN on their series, First Ladies, Influence and Image, which showed me how great these women were, that I was inspired to speak and then write and tell these stories because even all the travels and research I did couldn't fit in to a television show that had a 90-minute episode on every first lady. I mean, there's just so much. Uh, Amy and I were chatting via text, and it's just this is the beginning before we were America into the present day and all of the stuff that's happened in between that first ladies have really had a backstage pass, their thumb on the pulse, and access to things that we would have no idea and these stories just basically tell themselves, I'm just the first ladies man, I'm the vehicle. But you can get the books, I'll sign them and ship them at firstladiesman.com, and I would love to do so for anyone that's, that's looking for that holiday gift for the history and reader lover in their family or friends. I have to mention, though, that you did talk about the C-SPAN series, which kind of started this all, and it's really fun to watch both the series and then read the books. Books They're very complementary of each other. So check out firstladiesman.com. You can watch it there and order the books and have a whole have a whole winter um, extravaganza to yourself of like researching and understanding more about our first ladies. Well, we called you to talk first ladies and Christmas because yeah. one of the trademarks of the White House is their Christmas decor. And at the head of all of that, oftentimes is the first lady. How long has that been happening in the White House? Yeah, no, great question and point, Amy. I want to point out three first ladies and three significant dates over the course of time uh, um, with Christmas. Now, I'm not a Christmas historian, and I don't know where or when Christmas trees started and St. Nick and the whole everything. But in 1889, First Lady Caroline Harrison, who's not a very well-known First Lady, and Benjamin Harrison, not a very well-known or wildly popular president for, for anything remarkable. But they had a particularly tragic December as far as family deaths and some health issues. And to cheer things up and bring the festivities to the White House, just the family, Caroline Harrison has recorded the first family Christmas tree on the second floor residence of the White House in 1889. And that's incredible to me to think that that far into our country and our history and the White House, I mean, well after the Civil War, creeping up on the 20th century. We're coming right up on the 1890s at that point that there was no family Christmas tree that anyone knew of or to speak of in the White House. It's remarkable to me. So we thank Caroline Harrison for bringing that into there because families then followed after her. Now, in 1929, so 40 years later, it takes 40 years for a tree, a decorated tree, to make it downstairs in the public office areas of the White House – for the public to come in and enjoy. 
And that's Lou Hoover. Lou Hoover puts that Christmas tree downstairs and says, come on in, America and the rest of the world. Look at our Christmas tree and let's celebrate the holidays together. Now we jump ahead another 30 years plus, over 30 years, 32 years. And Jacqueline Kennedy is the first first lady to have a themed Christmas tree. And that's what we know, we today know, as the first lady tradition of having these Christmas tree themes um, uh, related to to trees and people coming in and helping decorate and all that stuff. Her theme was the Nutcracker Suite, and the whole White House was decked out with the Nutcrackers and the and the 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 the, the characters of, of that ballet and that performance and stuff. And it was so wildly popular that each first lady after followed in suit, and that's how we get the the themed decorated Christmas tree. It took us until the '60s to get the themed, so it hasn't really been happening for that long. No, all things considered, and 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 even al- almost 1900 before we even had a tree in there, which wow. that's the thing that blows me away. I, I just would have thought like you'd think John Adams, the first president, and and, and Abigail Adams to 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 live in the White House would put a tree up because you just well, figure it's been happening forever, but it just hasn't. And you wonder if maybe. The White House seemed because it wasn't as though they were trying to make the media look at the White House as a residence, as a people's residence to come and share and enjoy in. At that time, I'm sure, and I don't know, I'm just guessing, it was more of an office. Like this is where they lived and worked and because they had to sort of a thing. But you're absolutely right. And that's that's a fantastic point. And 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 even when Caroline Harrison put her tree up. It was still predominantly an office, and the second floor was the residence. It's, right. it's Edith Roosevelt in 1902 that moves in with her six kids and TR that says this place is not fit for a family of our size. And she's the one that gets the money that expands the White House and gets an East Wing for social events, a West Wing for offices and presidential business. And then the middle, essentially the, the, the existing footprint of the, the, of the White House from years prior, is the resident. And, and so there, there is a lot to that. It wasn't, it wasn't the, big, the big media hubbub that it is right. today and, and all the celebrations. You're absolutely right. It's like I'm sure people were like, yeah, it's the White House. They live and work there. What, what, what of it? <laughs> but, yeah, But right. you're right. I mean, now take the Kennedys and everyone else who are trying to make the White House the people's house, sort of. Like, this is our house, we live and work, but we live and work for you. And it sort of became this media sensation that we wanted in the White House. We wanted to see and be a part of it. Uh, Do you know, this is an off-the-wall quiz question, but when did tours of the White House start? Mm. Yeah, Tours have gone in and out. I don't know, I do not know when the first official White House tour, but I know that that prior to the Civil, well, Prior, prior to the to the 1900s, so so all through the 1800s, it was pretty much an open door, and they did. It was the people's house. They had a the a big thing was 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 like open houses on New Year's Day oh. were huge. Jackson, Andrew Jackson had wild like I mean like thousands of people on the White House lawn and coming in and out. Even during the Lincoln administration, and when when Johnson when when Andrew Johnson takes over. Andrew and, and Eliza Johnson take over. They had to redo so much of the White House because Lincoln had troops living there during the Civil War. And they said that the tobacco stains and the lice and the dirt and the filth from the soldiers coming through there was so bad they basically had to – I mean not gut the place, but they, they, did, a, right. they did a major overhaul during, during Andrew Johnson's administration with Eliza there. But um, you know, okay. there, were, there were massive parties Fascinating. And, and people coming through. Okay, fascinating. So Caroline Harrison, 1889, brings the first private Christmas tree. Lou Hoover yeah, brings a family. Christmas tree downstairs in 1929. Um, and that's Jackie, the big one. That's, that's, the, that's big the big one. one this there. is when it starts. Jackie Kennedy so has Hoover, the first themed Christmas tree. Okay, yeah, let's go back to Lou Hoover. I know you love Lou Hoover. I do. I do. Because, because when I go and give speeches, I say Lou Hoover, and everyone's like, Lou who? <laughs> I, people don't know who she is, and their accomplishments, even before they get a, got in the White House, were just just astonishing. They're just they're incredible, incredible people. Um, um, uh, so so what what 
what the Hoovers were doing in 1929 was they were having a holiday party, a Christmas party, for their staff and friends and family. There was a five-alarm fire that broke out in another part of the White House. So Mrs. Hoover is hosting a Christmas party with all these people, all these friends, these staff, their children, their families. And President Hoover and one of their sons is there on the roof with five different fire stations from D.C. putting out this significant, massive fire. And the guests were none the wiser. I mean, it's a big house and things like that, but you'd think the sirens and everything else, I don't know. Of course, I wasn't there. But for right. all intents and purposes, the, the party continued. I'm sure it did, wasn't the same as if nothing had happened. They rebuilt the White House. But what Mrs. Hoover did, and this is a perfect example of what the Hoovers would do and say and act upon, she took some of the burnt wood and embers and all the stuff from the fire, the relics actually of the fire, and invited all of the children and their families back, and they handmade Christmas ornaments and sold them for charity. From from the, essentially the rubble of the fire. From the rubble, from the burnt <laughs> ashes of the White House, a phoenix of Christmas ornaments for charity was born. And that's the kind of stuff that these first ladies do all the time. We just we just don't know it. We don't hear about it. Like Amy, we were talking that the, 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 it wasn't the big media push. It wasn't the big right. you know fandango and and a look at me, look at me. People were just doing things because it was the right thing to do. And there also wasn't the technology and the big you know we didn't have podcasts and CNN and the internet and electricity. Well, we had electricity in the Hoover, but you, right. you get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, they're just worth the the means. The information highway was more of a dirt road back then, and people just weren't as concerned about that kind of stuff, and they weren't as braggadocious about these things. And they, again, they did it because it was the right thing to do. There wasn't bumper stickers and T-shirts that say "Pay it forward." These people were doing it. That's why they're unusual for their time. That's why they're transformative, and they change the way we think and live for the better in this role of first lady that is not elected and not paid. They're doing it out of, out of what, and not, not, there's no job description. They don't have to, you don't, if you're married to someone who, who is elected president, man, woman, or, you know, alien, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be first lady. There's, there's no, there's, there's no law. It's just what they do. And, and many times there have been first ladies. Eliza Johnson would be a perfectly good example. She was infirm. She had tuberculosis, and, and she was a self-proclaimed invalid. She said, I can't do it. And her daughters did things. That happened a lot in the 1800s because of age or health and things like that. But then you'd get these strapping, virile, engaged people like Lou Hoover that we just never knew about that did all these incredibly wonderful things. And, and that's what you find in the books, and that's what I found, and that's how the first ladies made me the first ladies' man. I didn't, I didn't go to school for this. This wasn't something I had planned and premeditated for a long time. I was in the middle of this thing that was so incredible, and I saw these incredible people, thanks to the White House Historical Association and C-SPAN, that I thought, I've got to keep talking about this because people want to hear about it. And it's just been, it's been such an incredible journey, and, and a lot of yeah, kudos to you guys, and much thanks to you guys for your interest in always having me back to tell these stories. I love to talk about the First Ladies. And by the way, speaking of Christmas and the First Ladies, Jill Biden, our Christmas or, or our current First Lady, sort of unveiled the Christmas decorations of this year's White House, and it didn't yep, yep. have it didn't have near the 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 uh, talk about it as Melania Trump's. But I think that the New York Times put it perfectly, and their headline was something like, "Jill Biden's White House Christmas looks very." normal <laughs> and um, well, I, I mean but it does I, it's beautiful it's beautifully curated her theme is gifts from the heart i think mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um there's lots of packages adorning a doorway and there's lots of very traditionally um decorated trees uh but it, i mean beautiful stunning i love to look at the pictures of the white house decorations I tell you, I, I did a lot in between Michelle Obama and Melania Trump, and you know we've talked about this and social media and and the press and all this stuff. And I, I, I really, you know, it's always especially around the holidays when people start criticizing stuff, and it, it it really it bums me out because you know you look at 
you look, and I, I went to, I went to, I went to both. I went to uh, uh, Obama and, and Trump, and I looked when I first walked up to Melania Trump's White House in the in the Christmas season. She had beautiful. The White House is so white and so pretty and so majestic, and she had these green wreaths with simple red bows on every single window and candles in the wind. It looked classic. It looked fantastic. And you went in, and then because you know we just get more polarized time and time again because Trump either pushed people for or against and there was there was no real gray area in that and that gets more and more and more and a lot of people didn't like President Trump and therefore they didn't like his wife and therefore they criticized and said things about her her decorations and things like that where I look back at some of the other ones Christmas is weird man (laughs) Christmas is a weird (laughs) my tree I've got a silver tinsel tree with an Elvis star on top from Graceland it's red white and blue the tree itself is white and there's a lot of red white and blue for America it's far from what I would call traditional but it's very American and you look bright lights packages a guy in a big red suit coming down your chimney it's weird and you put up stuff to just to just enjoy the season and I go back and I look at Michelle Obama's and I mean, I, I don't see much different in in that they're decorating for Christmas. There's bright lights, there's snow, there's giant trees, there's giant overdone ornaments, a huge menorah on the on the south lawn. I mean, it's just it's craziness and it's wonderful and it's fantastic. I love Dr. Jill Biden's decoration. I love Melania Trump's both years. I love Michelle Obama's. I even it's so fun to go back. Betty Ford's is so seventies and so wild. With all this like patchwork and macrame and ornaments, Laura Bush had a had a, a home for the holidays was the theme in 2001. Well, look, yeah, 2001 and 9 11 happened. She had oh, this yeah. beautiful tree, and she had represented on the tree every home or home state of every president. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And it was classic, in, in my opinion. Lots of whites and lots of greens, and the lights were beautiful. And they had a little log cabin for Abe Lincoln and, and you know, all this Monticello for Jefferson. All this, she didn't she, – she, she put it up, and she did a video, but no one got to go through and see it because the security detail was so sure. crazy after 9-11, understandably so. But when the Bush Museum opened up in Dallas, the Bush 43 Museum, and I got to go there – uh, and and see as it opened up in that inaugural year would have been I think I think it was 2013 yeah, I'm almost positive it was 2013 or maybe it opened in 2012 and I got there by 2013. Regardless, I was there around Christmas and they had a 9/11 display that was just I mean it's 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 breathtaking and it's remarkable on so many different levels. Um, but they had that Christmas tree up and she got to put her Christmas tree up Aww. and show the world what she wanted to show people on in 2001. So I think it's a really nice time of year. And I think it's a time of year when we really, really should step back and just say, these ladies are doing their best. These ladies have a lot of people to please. And when, when it comes to decorations, you know, it's subjective and it's, it's just, it's just a good fun time of year. And let's just say, you know, if if it's not your cup of tea, move on. There'll be more decorations next year. Another first lady will come in four to eight years. But, you know, everyone's just trying to celebrate and have a good time and put some stuff up. And I just love all of it. And I love talking about it and especially the history. Andy Oak is the first ladies man. And these women were certainly unusual for their time. You can pick up his book. If you enjoyed these stories, boy, I mean, he hasn't even scratched the surface. He's not even in the same room as the surface at this point. He's got so <laughs> many amazing stories. You'd be shocked at what you don't know about these influential people who helped shape the country we live in today. Andy, always a pleasure to have you on. I hope you have a great Christmas with your disco Christmas tree and your Graceland (laughs) star. Thank you so much for spending some time with us on the Mighty 790 and 104.7 FM KFGO. Happy holidays to all your listeners, and thanks so much, Amy and JJ.